41 verses out of the ninth chapter, actually the whole ninth chapter of the Gospel of John this morning. A very long story, and there's so much more that can be said about it. Interesting story. There's a lot of stuff going on there that if we don't look for it, we might miss it. Or to kind of put it in the parameters of the story, if we don't look for it, we might be blind to it. Right? Who asked for this man to be healed? Number one. Number two, I heard that, I I saw an answer over here and I heard another answer. Um, The disciples' question really isn't out of line. Because you have to understand the day and time, right? In the day and time that Jesus walked this earth, if you were, if you were anyway physically ill, that physical ailment was related to sin. So it, the, the disciples weren't out of line asking, who sinned, this man or his parents? But think about this. He was blind at birth. So if he sinned, he sinned before he was born. Is that even possible? I get, I'm seeing no's over here and I'm hearing yeses over here. So I'm not going to answer that question. Number one, who asked for this man to be healed? Number two, if the man is the one who sinned, he had to sin before he was born. Is that even possible? Why is it even talked about that it's a Sabbath day? We will talk about that one just a little bit because it's an interesting fact for us to to know and to remember, right? So this chapter, 41 verses, there are five verses of introduction to the story. There are two verses that talk to us about the miracle. There are seven at the end where Jesus meets the man again and talks to him some more. So that's 14 verses out of 41, which means there are 27 verses of... The Pharisees investigating this story. The majority of this chapter is about people who couldn't believe the fact that a miracle had happened. And the biggest holdback for the Pharisees was the fact that this miracle happened on the Sabbath day. And why is that important? Because how did Jesus heal this man? He came up to him, he spat on the ground, and he made mud. Now what do you have to do to make mud? You have to... to to need, right? Need, you have to work. Needing is one of the 39 forbidden tasks of work on the Sabbath day. It's actually written into the Levitical law. So he emphatically broke the Levitical law of, of working on the Sabbath. So he kneaded the, the spit into the mud and then he spread the mud over the man's eyes. And the man goes off and he washes and he comes back and he's able to see. And People bring him before the Pharisees and the Pharisees say, how is it that you see? And he tells them and they don't believe it. So they call for the man's parents. The man's parents comes in and say, I'm not getting in the middle of this. Talk to him. I'm not getting kicked out of the synagogue. You need to talk to to him. Right. But they testify that he's able to see. They don't know how he's able to see. They just know they did say that he's able to see. So then they bring the blind man back, the formerly blind man back, and they ask him again. And obviously this man gets it right because he's now um, joking with the Pharisees. I've already told you why and how I've become able to see. Why do you keep asking me? Do you want to follow this man too? Right? He's, he's, He's poking back at the Pharisees. And they throw him out of the temple. So here's the other interesting part to this story. Who are the characters in this story? We have Jesus and the disciples, the beginning, right? We have some Pharisees. We have the blind man. What's his name? The 
Well, he's the man that was formerly blind, right? He's the man who was born blind from birth. He's the man who was formerly blind. The man who is now able to see. But he doesn't get a name. And he's always classified by what his past held for him. He's always classified by what happened behind him. He's always classified about who he was before. Not who he is now and who he's going to be into the future. And isn't that really where each one of us sit almost each and every day? Not to say that some of the things that we define ourselves from our paths are not good. Right? They could be. Cancer survivor. What are some other things from our past that could be classified as as good to remember? That's your cue. <laughs> Not we got nothing. You got nothing. What are some things from your past that would be good to remember that you that you overcame? Well, boy, this is failing really bad. <laughs> Quit, former smoker. There you go. Ooh, former not child-bearing person. <laughs> I think how to word that one. Right, becoming a parent, graduating from school are good things that, you know, having a degree. Getting over a tragedy in your life, right? Not that you ever get over it, but that you've moved beyond the fact that that is now the, the focus and the, the understanding. Right, there's lots of things from our past that we, that we can remember and, and hold on to and, and love the fact that people have helped us through and brought us beyond. But there's also a lot of things in our past that we hold on to that we don't need to. Like the man who was formerly blind. Or the person who was imprisoned for doing something and has now turned their life around. Or the person who is widowed or divorced. Or... Any number of other things that we don't need to hold on to from our past. Right? Because it's not about what happened back there. It's about what's happening right here and right now. And about what we're moving into. Right? Because everybody wants to know who's at fault. We always want to know who's at fault so we know who to blame. That's what this text is about today. It's about, it's about the Pharisees trying to figure out who can I blame for this? Because they don't understand the fact that God was here and God did something miraculous and God did something that nobody asked anybody to do, right? That was the very first question. Who asked for this man to be healed? And the answer is no one. Jesus was walking along and he saw a man born blind from birth and he called him out and healed him. The man didn't ask for it. None of his family was there and asked for it. He didn't have any friends that brought him to Jesus and said, he's blind, he needs to be healed. Jesus didn't even ask him if he wanted to be healed. Jesus just healed him. Because that's how God works. He comes into our lives when we don't expect it and he does things for us that we can't possibly understand and we question it and we wonder why and we wonder who we can blame because somebody's got to be to blame, right? Right? Like you're washing dishes and a baseball comes through the window. And they start to argue, right? You call them in and they're quiet for like five seconds, ten seconds, and then they start to argue. You told me to stand there. You threw the ball to me. I didn't want to hit it, right? It's all about who's at fault. Because it's not about that, though. It's about who we are now. And the blind man got it. And tried to tell the Pharisees that. But do we really get it? See, because there's all kinds of things in our lives that could hold us back. There's all kinds of things in our lives that could keep us from being God's child. There's all kinds of things that can 
try to distract us from remembering who we are or whose we are. Right? There's all kinds of things that can distract us from what happens right here, like we're going to see just a little bit later with Blaze. Where God takes us and claims us and names us as His children and is going to do things in our lives that we can't possibly understand. We just have to live in faith that God is working in and through us so that His love can be made known in the world. Because it's all about us looking forward to the cross and not backwards. It's all about us living in the now and understanding who God is in our lives and not wanting it our way but giving it up to God. You see, there's a reason in the car that the, the, the window on the front is much bigger than your rearview mirror. Because it's more important for you to see where you're going than for you to remember where you came from. But the mirror is there for you to look back every now and then to remember or to see what's coming behind you. But it's more important for us to look forward. Last weekend, I was on a spiritual retreat called Via de Cristo. And as a pastor on this retreat, I got to give two talks about grace. I love to talk about grace. They actually let me talk for almost 30 minutes a time when I got up there. So feel lucky that, you know, we're only at, where are we at now? We're only at 11 and a half minutes right now. So I still have another 19 to go if we were. That was a pretty nervous laugh. I don't know. <laughs> right? So, but I was on this weekend and I, I had to introduce myself at my first talk and I said, you know, hello. My name is Pastor Jerry Wortley. I serve at St. John's Lutheran Church in Little Swamico. I made Western North Carolina Via de Cristo number 45 in the fall of 1999 where I sat at the table of St. John. I'm married to my wife and I have three children. That was the beginning of my first talk. And when I got to my second talk about grace and obstacles to grace and what keeps us from grace, right? I had to tell the, the men that I was talking to that morning, and I have to tell you that I just lied to you. No, my name is Pastor Jerry Wortley. <laughs> I do serve at St. John's Luther Church in Little Swamico, Wisconsin. I am married, but I have five children. I have five children. Two of them are here. One of them is missing in action this morning. Probably still asleep. <laughs> Two of them are already with God. Krista and I, and I say and I, I had no part in this, but we had two miscarriages before Karis came. So I told this to these gentlemen because it was an obstacle for us, right? Right? We wanted children. We, we were ready. And my wife, in her profound wisdom, said to me one night, we've said that we're ready, but have we ever asked God if we should have children? So that night we prayed. And I put our lives into the hands of God. Remind you, this was before I became a pastor. Nine months later, we got Karis Rebecca. Now, if you don't know Karis Rebecca, Karis is, what does Karis mean? I've said this before. Grace. grace. Karis is the Greek word for grace. And who is Rebecca? From the Old Testament. Isaac's, is, I, Isaac's wife. And what did Abraham do and the, and the slave that Abraham sent do before they found Rebecca? So Rebecca, in a way, means answer to prayer. So Karis, Rebecca is a grace answer to prayer. I have to remind myself that now when she's 15. <laughs> but 
that's where we get caught up. When we get stuck in our lives to the point that we can't see beyond what we want or how we want our lives to be. Those obstacles come in and those things take control and our lives don't end out the way that we want them to. Because God works in and through many wonderful things and many very bad things in all of our lives. And if we can only give it up to Him and stop focusing on what we were and focusing on who we are, we are God's children, named and claimed at that font and given His grace and sent out into the world to show everyone else that same love that same mercy, that same understanding. So don't focus on where we've been. But look at where you are and where God is going to take us and follow Him because I guarantee you it will be the best life that you could ever possibly imagine.